From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's coming up. A visit with K-State's Brian Brigham. He'll talk about the actions taken by the Federal Reserve Bank in an attempt to stem the economic slide brought on by the coronavirus and how those relate to the economic well-being of agriculture. Also today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth is back to offer advice this time on scouting your alfalfa stands for early alfalfa weevil activity. He cautions about treating those weevils too soon. Jeff also has a follow-up report on army cutworm feeding in winter wheat. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd will talk about various insects that may start to turn up in home landscapes soon and whether they merit a treatment response. All on this Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Thursday edition of Agriculture Today. Yet another angle for you on the fallout, and this time economically, from the coronavirus outbreak. And of course, there's been information ad nauseum about this floating about the last several days. But we want to bring in a perspective here on the action in response to the outbreak and the financial tumult that's happened on the part of the Federal Reserve Bank and what that means to agricultural interests as well. Joining us via phone is Brian Brigham. He's an agricultural economist here at K-State, as you know, and the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center out of the university. So it's been a whirlwind, Brian, and just to speak broadly to the financial response to all of this, it's been devastating, it's been unprecedented in many ways. How would you characterize it? Well, I think uh, those strong terms are probably appropriate for where we're at. Uh, We've seen a lot of disruption in financial markets, a lot of questions about the economy going forward. You know, the thing of it is with this COVID-19 pandemic where we're seeing a, a retrenching, like people pulling in and doing social distancing for a U.S. economy that is driven off of consumption. You know, two-thirds to like 66 to 70 percent of our gross domestic product comes from consumption. We are a nation of consumers, and if we're not out consuming, that creates a lot of questions going forward. So you are seeing the Federal Reserve provide a response to that. And that came just a couple of days back. Give us the full details on what action was taken. Yeah, so the Fed is, this is, you know, partly why we have the Federal Reserve to help guide our economy and and hopefully provide uh, stimulus and support when we need it. There's uncertainty, but also it also has on the other side of trying to cool us down. Certainly we're not there. Uh, There's need for growth. So the primary monetary policy tool that the Fed has at its disposal is the federal funds rate. So the Fed funds rate is the rate at which banks blend and borrow from each other in short-term markets, uh, and it's the, a clear signal to be sent to the economy and even to global markets. And the Fed recently announced that they are dropping it to the zero bound. So if you remember that term, that is related to the 2008 financial crisis where we reached that unthinkable zero bound. So we are going to be there now and again in an effort to try and provide support. So that is one of the tools that the Fed is using to try and stimulate and provide stability uh, to the U.S. economy. And are there more on top of that then? Yeah, there there actually is. Um, The Fed is taking a pretty aggressive approach, somewhat similar to what we saw in the uh, 2008 financial crisis. But before we uh, get to where we're at today, it's important to know that the Fed's balance sheet expanded to $4.5 trillion 
following the 2008 financial crisis. And then in 2018, the economy was on pretty good footing. The Fed started to unwind the balance sheet, begin to let those securities that were meant to provide growth and stability to the economy begin to unwind. So it moved from four and a half trillion back down to just under four trillion, right around four trillion dollars. And at that time, though, in October of 2019, the Fed committed to buying $60 billion per month of U.S. Treasuries in an effort to try to provide some support to some softness that was being identified within the economy. Again, trying to uh, spur growth, trying to also you know, lower some of those longer-term interest rates. I think many farmers, agribusinesses, cooperatives that I've talked to saw long-term interest rates really fall at the end of 19 and then in 2020 and provided them with some opportunities to lock in some pretty cheap longer-term money. So there were some opportunities there. Okay, so fast forward to where we're at today. The Fed will continue to buy that $60 billion in treasuries, but they've also committed to buying an additional $37 billion of treasuries per month, so growing the balance sheet even more. But the big splash, the one that got a lot of attention uh, with financial markets, was the one and a half trillion the Fed has committed to providing to short-term funding for markets. So again, that one and a half trillion is pretty similar, kind of reminiscent of what we had in the 2008 financial crisis, where the Fed's balance sheet went from 800 billion, 850 billion in assets, and shot up to almost two trillion, or just over uh, two trillion, just right away. So we're going to see a spike in the Fed's balance sheet. So move from roughly four and a half, probably get close to six trillion. Now that one and a half trillion is very short term in nature. Mm-hmm. Won't last very long, just like it did in the financial crisis. It's meant to ensure that asset markets and credit markets are functioning. That's the primary purpose of it. So really, to that we as consumers and, and us in agriculture, we really won't notice much of that. That'll be on Wall Street and helping with credit markets. And then the final thing that they've done is created two different facilities, a commercial paper funding facility, as well as a primary dealer credit facility. And the purpose of this is, again, on the credit end, to help ensure credit needs of households and businesses are met. We do borrow and lend quite a bit in our U.S. economy, so we, the Fed is focused on making sure that is not disrupted. So, again, those are the primary tools using the balance sheet, different facilities, and interest rates to try and help provide support to the U.S. economy. Brian, of course, though, the trillion dollar question here is, will all of this collectively provide the stimulus needed to help stabilize the economy in this dire downturn? Yeah, that, and that's a great question, Eric. And that is unfortunately something we're just going to have to, to watch and monitor as things develop. You know, we look back on the 2008 financial crisis, and this crisis is different. That 2008 financial crisis was created by the housing bubble, and it popped, and we had too much debt out there at households. Right now, you know, things um, are different. You know, this is a pandemic where we are retrenching and pulling in. So hopefully that this will be enough to have us bounce back. But certainly the likelihood of a recession has gone up. Again, it goes back to that consumption and how is it going, how is businesses going to keep people hired and and employed? I mean, how is that all going to evolve? But this has been pretty aggressive, and I think by and large, the markets are receiving it fairly well. It's uncertain to know exactly how they're going to respond because we see this whipsaw effect that's going on. But again, all of it is meant to provide that stability and support. Specific to agriculture, then, how will these actions resonate? Does that serve as a signal to agricultural producers to look again at their debt, where they're at, refinancing, any of these things? Well, again, on the the Fed funds rate, that doesn't really have a whole lot of effect on what farmers, ranchers, agribusinesses would be borrowing and lending at. It's more the other actions the Fed has taken to try to lower the longer end of the yield curve, not the short end, 
but the longer end. And we have seen those rates come down. So I think each farm, ranch, agribusiness needs to look at possibly refinancing some of their longer-term credit, lock-ins that. I think the bigger thing for us in agriculture to take this a signal of, and I know it's difficult today, especially with the depressed commodity prices and the low net farm incomes and the challenges we've had there, but we got to focus on liquidity. I think building up that working capital, making sure that we have that available to us to get through these difficult times, be very mindful of your costs, watch that because we're in a period of uncertainty, but possibly on the back end, you know, we we could be uh, doing pretty well. You know, hopefully, you know, as the U.S. consumer, as we get through this and we go back to buying goods, we'll see a significant rebound. Uh, and that should hopefully benefit agriculture. But again, each individual situation is unique. You got to focus on can I lock in rates to help my operation? Got to build the liquidity because that is something that's going to be needed to get through these uncertain times and hopefully position yourself for growth going forward. And just to tag on to that, something that one of your colleagues, Dwayne Hund, was inferring as we talked with him earlier this week, that the actual fundamentals of farm finances outside of this episode have not changed that much. So management should remain on an even keel as much as one can attain that for the immediate future. I would agree with that 100%. Just like what it was in the 2008 financial crisis, position yourself for that growth on the backside, and hopefully we can see a significant rebound. Hopefully there is a lot of pent-up demand and we can begin to have more trade flowing and begin to see a rebound in commodity prices. But right now, the fundamentals, as Dwayne was talking about, those have never changed. Manage your operation as efficiently as you possibly can. Interesting times they are, to say the very, very least. Brian, we appreciate you contributing these thoughts to the situation. Many thanks. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Eric. He's Brian Brigaman, the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center out of the Agricultural Economics Department here at Kansas State University. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're back now on Agriculture Today. Crop producers, more heads up on early insect activity in those field crops now with Jeff Whitworth aboard crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. We invite him by once more because he has received a flush of calls from producers in recent days about various pests that those growers are seeing out there, one of which we've touched upon a few days back, but apparently the activity is such that it merits a second look, and that is army cutworm in wheat and alfalfa, Jeff. Yes, I have received a slew of calls Hmm. about some of the early season pests, and the army cutworm is one that probably leads the pack so far, and it has for about a week, maybe two weeks. Apparently, there's a lot of top dressing of wheat or spraying of wheat going on right now, and after we talked on the radio last week and talked about army cutworms, a lot of folks are interested in adding an insecticide to the spray that they're doing uh, already scheduled in their wheat. That brings up several problems. Number one, it goes kind of against the IPM principle, the integrated pest management principle that I really believe in and have always believed in, and that means you treat if you need to treat and only if you need to treat and not uh, just prophylactically or just in case. Uh, That can do a lot more damage then it does good. I mean, you don't always think that way, and you think, yeah, if I put a little insecticide in or herbicide or whatever it is, with treatment that's already going on, I save application costs. I agree with that. I mean, that's true. That's I, I don't blame you at all for that. 
but still, if it's not needed, if there are a few insects or mites or whatever are already there, you can speed up the process of resistance. And so we don't like to see that. Plus, you can also kill some of the non-target organisms that may help later on. And that's the case with the army cutworm. They are very spotty. The infestations in some fields, you can find a lot of them in an area. Some fields, you can find them fairly scattered across the whole field. Some fields, you can't find any. So to me, this is an ideal situation where you really need to get out and scout before you treat. If you do get out and scout, you do decide you needed to treat, and you are going to put some treatment on top of your wheat, that is a good time to add the insecticide in at the time, but only if you need it. There are a few beneficials out right now. There will be more later as the weather warms up. But there are a few beneficials out right now, and we need those beneficials. We need to save the beneficials for later. Right now there are some lady beetles and some green lacewings that I've seen. And if you spray for army cutworms where there are no army cutworms, you're still going to kill these uh, beneficials. And if we do get some aphids later on, like bird chariot aphids or, or green bugs, which have the potential of carrying barley yellow dwarf diseases, you're not going to have any beneficials there to help with those populations because you're going to have wiped them out in a needless insecticide application on wheat or alfalfa. Like I said, if you need it, sure, go ahead and do it. That's I'm not saying that. I'm just saying make sure you get out and scout because there's such a disparity of these insect populations in wheat and alfalfa right now around the state that you just got to get out and scout and look and detect what's in your field before you determine whether to treat or not. And remind us briefly of the threshold to trigger that decision, if you would. Well, the threshold in first-year alfalfa or alfalfa maybe that's struggling a little bit with other stresses is like one to two larvae per square foot. And in wheat, if again, the same thing, if the wheat's struggling a little bit or not tillering very well, and you got one to two per treatment threshold, you might consider treating. Otherwise, if the wheat looks normal, is growing pretty good, I'd wait till you got five or six per square foot. And same with uh, a good alfalfa field, well-established alfalfa field. It takes a few more to actually cause damage. Well, that's the word on army cutworm activity in wheat, in alfalfa. Take due note, growers. Alfalfa producers in particular, though, will have a keen interest, of course, Jeff, in alfalfa weevils. And we want to, as we talk here, mention a helpful tool that producers can utilize to determine timing of weevil treatment. Yes, MesoNet is available online. You can check in with that. The weather lab at K-State has different weather stations set up all over the state. And when you go to the MesoNet, you can pull up the map of the, of the state. You can hit the weather station nearest to you. They may not have one right in your backyard, but they have them pretty close. You can pull up that weather station. You can hit. Then you can click on uh, alfalfa weevil, and it will tell you how many thermal units have accumulated or growing degree days have accumulated since the 1st of January. And it also tells you how many you need to have the eggs hatch or first instar larvae become second instar larvae, et cetera. It kind of gives you a, an explanation of development. So you know when to go out and start looking for alfalfa weevils. Now, we have been out looking you know, in the north central and the central part of the state, and I've not found any yet. Uh, that was as of last week. You got to realize army cutworms, Alfalfa weevils, they're going to feed anytime the temperature's above 40 degrees or the eggs inside the stems, in the case of alfalfa weevils, are going to be developing anytime the temperature's over like 45 or 48 degrees. So even though you can't get out in the field or you don't feel like getting out in the field because it's chilly and it's wet, they're still developing anytime that temperature's over 45 degrees and they're developing 24-7. So if the temperature gets down to 50 degrees at night and it's 70 degrees during the day, they're still developing, and they're still going to be feeding. Once those eggs hatch from the alfalfa weevil, those little weevil larvae are going to start feeding on the alfalfa, as are the army cutworms. So just because it's too wet to get out doesn't mean they're not uh, still eating and causing damage. So so something to consider. One of the things I was going to mention about 
the Army cutworm also, I've got several questions about how much longer are they going to develop? Because in some cases, you can find some pretty good-sized Army cutworms, but the ones I've seen, they're uh, a whole bunch of different sizes. They're small ones and large ones. What I've seen in the past, and, and I've been doing this, I've been following Army cutworms for about 25 years, but I've only seen about three different years where the infestation levels were such that you could find a lot of them to watch, like this year. In in the three previous years, the larvae fed clear up until about oh, mid-April, uh, the first part of May. But it all is 100% driven by the temperature. So as we have cool temperatures this week, it's going to slow it down. If it warms them back up, um, it'll speed their development back up. The same with the alfalfa weevil. Alfalfa weevils, again, temperature dependent, temperature related uh, in as far as the eggs hatch and as far as the development goes. I'm sure some of the eggs are hatching around, especially in south central Kansas. And so if you get out and start looking, just don't be too quick. This is my recommendation, at least. Don't be too quick to spray for alfalfa weevils. We have a treatment threshold that we've established over the years. Everybody's a little bit different, but usually it works out pretty good. If you have a third to a 50% infestation, that means one out of every three or one out of every two stems infested, that's the time to treat. A lot of guys get out there and they start finding this early damage and they think, oh, man, I want to spray now, get on top of it, and then I don't have to worry about it. But you have eggs still to come. You have larvae still to come. Uh, so they can still be hatching over the next three or four weeks. And if you spray now, that insecticide's not going to have any residual activity after that. Plus, that alfalfa is going to put on new growth, which won't have any insecticide residual on it anyway. So the treatment threshold, a half to a third of an infestation level, that's usually about the time to treat. Occasionally, it might get cold and you still have to spray again. But that that's worked out pretty well for us over the years. So just keep that in mind. Very well. And do make full use of that tool at M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U, the Mesonet site out of the Weather Data Library at K-State, tracking thermal units that would prompt alfalfa weevil development. And a quick advisory on wheat curl mites, Jeff. Yes. I've heard a little bit about wheat streak mosaic, which is vectored by the wheat curl mite. I've heard of several different places where growers think they have wheat streak mosaic because of the color of the wheat. You need to get out and make sure because there are several other things that can cause the same kind of display or symptoms on the wheat. If there are wheat curl mites, I'd really like to know about it, especially if they're uh, the last infestation I've I saw that was a significant infestation was in Sling County, and that means they've moved quite a bit east because normally you used to think of Wheat Street Mosaic as a western Kansas problem, but they are moving east, and we've actually done some surveying and found wheat curl mites all the way up into the Kansas City area. So hmm. if you do have some symptoms or some wheat that l- look like what you think it might be wheat streak mosaic, please give me a call or email me and we'll come out and get collect some samples and take them to the plant path lab and try and get that determined for sure and see if there are some uh, mites around. We'll have you back again soon, Jeff. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. An update on insect activity in wheat and alfalfa around Kansas. That's crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension. We'll return shortly with more on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Today's agricultural news headlines coming your way now, these courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, even as the president of the American Farm Bureau Federation was on a conference call talking about the importance of ensuring H-2A workers continue getting visas, the U.S. State Department yesterday halted processing of all routine visas in most countries around the world. Farm groups have been stressing reaction to the pandemic could disrupt food production in the coming months if guest workers are shut out of the country. The State Department posted an alert on its website that U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services would suspend all routine in-person services until at least April the 1st to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Initially, the State Department had announced earlier in the week it was shutting down visa applications from Mexico. The U.S. consulate in Mexico then stated that veteran H-2A workers who were returning to the U.S. could get their applications processed because they don't require new interviews for for their applications to be approved. Now, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue personally intervened in the with the State Department on the H-2A situation, and a broader group of farm groups, the Agricultural Workforce Coalition, called on Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to continue processing H-2A visas at consulates and also to treat all agricultural appointments as emergency visa services. Meantime, in response to requests from the U.S. Cattlemen's Association for aid to livestock producers, Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota has introduced a bill to provide a specific payment to cattle producers due to losses from COVID-19. That bill details that the USDA would pay cattle producers for feeder cattle sold here in 2020 if the average national price would fall below $150 per hundredweight, or in the case of finished cattle, if the average national price falls below $121 per hundredweight. The payment amount would be the difference between those prices and the average price sold for the feeders or for live cattle in those months. Now, the Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Ethan Lane, said in a call with reporters that his organization has been working almost exclusively on the impacts of the coronavirus to cattle producers right now. He cited the complaints over the declining live cattle prices and the spread with boxed beef prices. Lane said the NCBA has pressed packers to aggressively bid cattle in the cash market. The NCBA also wants to ensure livestock producers can take part in any congressional aid package that would include the low-interest loans to small businesses as well. Both the NCBA and AFBF had also requested that the Department of Transportation provide some clarity on ensuring that the waiver on hours of service be expanded for the full agricultural supply chain. Different states also have waived weight limits on trucks for grocery and commodity deliveries as well. In other news, the deadline for crop year 2019 acreage enrollment in the farm safety net programs has come and gone. So what do the preliminary sign-up numbers look like? Here's a glance at that from the USDA's Rod Bain. We're still working with some producers that had appointments scheduled and getting that work cleaned up. Regarding 2019 crop year agricultural risk coverage and price loss coverage sign up at local farm service agency offices. The deadline to schedule appointments to enroll this past Monday. Yet preliminary numbers revealed by FSA Administrator Richard Fordyce Wednesday indicate. We are 105% signed up for ARC and PLC from our numbers that we expected for enrollment meaning the numbers of ARC PLC enrollment contracts during sign-up under the 2014 Farm Bill. The administrator says, still being compiled, the number of enrollments for ARC versus PLC, or the amount of crop acreage enrolled in either program. And although 2019 crop year ARC PLC acreage enrollment has concluded... For the upcoming crop year 2020, the enrollment deadline is June 30th. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And coming your way next on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Providing that, as always, is Greg Akagi. Greg?
Joining us now is Mike Steenhook, who's the executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition. And Mike, you just recently received good news concerning a project that's taking place in the lower portion of the Mississippi River that's going to be good news for many Kansas producers. You know, if I was to be asked what's the number one infrastructure enhancement that would provide the greatest benefit to the widest array of farmers throughout the United States, it would be deepening the lower Mississippi River. It's really the launching point for 60% of U.S. soybean exports, 59% of corn exports, by far the number one export region for both commodities. And there's been this long aspiration to deepen that stretch of the river, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, past New Orleans into the Gulf of Mexico, from 45 feet to 50 feet. We had good news late last year before Christmas that Congress provided the funding for it. And now on February 10th, the administration gave the green light to move forward with it. So work will commence on it later this year. And we anticipate at least that first critical phase being done by fall of 2021. Farmers have really been actively engaged in this. And one of the things that we really aspire to do is to make it a Kansas thing, a Minnesota thing, a Missouri thing. And we were successful in doing that. So we had this broad coalition that really promoted it. The farmer directors of the United Soybean Board actually committed $2 million to help underwrite the cost of the project, the non-federal component of it. So we're very happy that this is going to move forward. It's going to make us more competitive, and we're going to see the benefits of that extend into the interior parts of the country in the form of more profitability for farmers. We'll just use soybeans as an example. They head towards that direction. You don't have to look further than getting a lot of them out to the Port of Catoosa. Farmers in Kansas that are willing to drive a considerable distance to access that market because they can get a more favorable price and it offsets the higher cost of delivery to places like the Port of Catoosa. And so it's a very appealing marketing opportunity and we want to see that enhanced. And so making that barge to ocean vessel supply chain more economical, deepening the lower Mississippi will help achieve that. We also are excited that when you make barge transportation more economical, what that essentially does is it extends the draw area to our major rivers and it creates greater modal overlap between barge and rail. That puts a downward pressure on rail rates because rail has to fight more to get their customers and barge has to fight more to get their customers. Competition is a good thing for shippers. It's a great thing for farmers. And those were the comments of Mike Steenhook, Executive Director of the Sway Transportation Coalition, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. Greg Akagi there. Slipping in this quick reminder to have a look at our podcast service. It's as easy as going to agtoday.net, agtoday.net. And this is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. This being a Thursday, we're around once more to our weekly horticulture segment and our first opportunity of this new spring to visit with K-State Research and Extension horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, a regular contributor to this segment. But it's been a while, Raymond, because we had to slug our way through the winter. So welcome back. And during this first visit, what we'd like to do is give folks an idea of what insects to be ready for in lawn and garden as we embark on warmer weather here. Nothing much happening at the moment, though. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, first of all, Eric, it's a pleasure to be back and start the 2020 season again under the present circumstances, but still the insects aren't concerned about that. So, right. yeah, really right now, depending on the, uh, you know, what the temperatures we're having, there's very going to be minimal insect activity. However, I think people should be aware as the temperatures increase, the days get longer, plants start putting out foliage. We should expect to see a number of insect pests, and, and one of those is the eastern tent caterpillar. The eastern tent caterpillar is one of our earliest caterpillars caterpillar defoliators, and I'm sure people will, will recognize it's the one that has those nests in the crotch of cherry and plum and trees like that that are out there. The larvae come out during the daytime, feed on the newly emerged leaves, and then eat, and, and, they, and on young plants, they can cause some substantial damage because as the leaves come out, the caterpillar
caterpillars will eat it and the plant can't manufacture food. So that's a concern, but you can go ahead and take a rake or break open the nest and, and expose the caterpillars and the birds will probably come in and feed on, on the caterpillars. But those will start to make their move fairly soon now, you think? Is that how they operate? Well, it depends again on the temperatures, Eric. You know, they, if they just start warming up, I, I would imagine we see them probably uh, early April okay. in most cases. But really, on um, maybe the southern part of the state, they might see them sooner. But again, it's all it's all we get contingent on those uh, those ambient air temperatures we receive. But the idea with the eastern tent caterpillar is to physically remove it as opposed to spraying it. Yeah, it's difficult. Once they're in the nest, it's difficult to spray them because the nest provides protection. So you can take a rake or a force of water spray to just disrupt that nest. They'll be exposed, and then you'll have birds and other probably other vertebrates going in after them. But I don't think there's any rational or justification for actually spraying them at that point, Eric. But be alert to eastern tent caterpillar activity early on in the spring. And there are two tree borers that you wanted to bring to folks' attention right away here as spring gets rolling. The lilac ash borer will be active soon, you say? Yeah, the lilac ash borer is actually a caterpillar borer. We typically uh, encounter them in, in April. There could be one or two generations a year. The adults will come out, the males or maybe the females, and the females will then consequently lay eggs on the bark of an ash or lilac tree. The larva will tunnel in and then, of course, start feeding on the, uh, the internal contents of the, of the tree. Once the larva in the tree, it's, it's, it's almost too late. So that's why if you do have a history of the lilac or ash borer on your lilac or ash trees, then you can apply a insecticide barrier we generally recommend permethrin permethrin is a pyrethroid with long residual activity and you spray from the base to about six to eight feet and so when the eggs are laid the larva are hit that barrier and are consequently killed so that prevents their entry into the tree but also we just maintain the health of your plants water fertility pruning and mulching things like that uh, the peach tree borer is a problem, obviously, on peach, and it's relative to the lesser peach tree borer can be a problem. They're very similar to lilac ash borer. They are caterpillar borers, not wood boring uh, beetles, and they, they lay their eggs at the base of a, a peach tree, and the eggs hatch in the larva tunnel through, and they can cause some substantial damage if, if not dealt with. But the same thing would be like our insecticide barrier. There are some pheromone traps that producers can use or even gardeners could use to capture the adult males, and that'll tell you that they're out. In most cases for insects, the males come out first and the females later, but that'll give you sort of an early detection. I need to put a barrier treatment to prevent those larvae from entering the tree. But you would put those barriers on fairly early here before letting either of these get out of hand. Right. I'd, I'd probably put them on early April if the temperature is conducive to. Now, remember, if it rains, yeah. you may have to go back out there and make another application. Yeah. But you need to be on that as quickly as possible in either case. Yeah, yeah, to prevent the larva from entering, entering the tree, yes. All right. That would be the early response to potential lilac ash borer or peach tree borer mm-hmm. problems. Now you say we can expect a flush of aphids in the springtime, early spring. Yeah, that, that again is going to be conducive on the uh, the temperatures, but yeah, as the new growth comes out, the aphids do tend to be a problem on the new growth. It's very tender, easy for them to feed upon. They feed on a wide variety of plants. They're very prolificous, meaning they're, they're, they feed on a, a lot of different plant types. However, they're really easy to deal with if you just have them on your shrubs, spirea or whatever, just take a force of water spray and just dislodge them, and, and that really they won't come back. So but you may have to do that more than once because, you know, aphids are very prolific from the standpoint of reproduction. So that's what we generally recommend. And if you stay on that, you don't really have to spray any insecticides. And there's some, if the natural enemies are out during that time of year, they can also provide some level of regulation. But, yeah, aphids tend to be one of our earliest spring uh, sucking insects that comes out and feeds on a wide variety of ornamentals, trees and shrubs, annuals, perennials, and vegetable crops, too. Be alert for aphids as well. Lastly, we'd leave folks with this, Raymond. Well, you've been hard at work in the off-season, cranking up several extension horticultural insect publications, you say, that folks can now tap into. Yeah, we've been uh, working with communications to uh, provide new and revised uh, versions of extension publications. One of them was Scale Insect Pest. It's a very colorful brochure. 
There was one on grubs, one on aphids. We uh, did a new bagworm publication, which is now available. And then recently, uh, one that came out called Insect and Mite Pest of Vegetable Gardens. I really like it. It's got some good images I put together, and it's been getting some good play. And then I'm recently um, trying, well, we'll have to see what happens, but the Japanese beetle, I'm developing a new one for that. So we're trying to allocate some time to work on some of these uh, extension publications, a little more colorful, easier text to read. And so if people would get online and you're, if you're home with the kids and want something to read, this insect that might pest the vegetable gardens will, will get you ready for the, for the coming season. It would give you a great start on yes. dealing with these pests. Entomology.ksu.edu is a good site to check out where you can access all of that. And Raymond, as we go along here, we'll be talking with you frequently about lawn and garden insect pests to contend with and how to do so. Appreciate your time right here. Many thanks. Always enjoy it, Eric, and look forward to a uh, hopefully a fruitful 2020 season. Raymond Cloyd, our guest for this week's horticulture segment. He's a horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.